Hey everyone, welcome back to the 443 Security Simplified. I'm your host, Spark the Liberty, and joining me today is... Corey Big Data Scares Me Not Griner. Welcome to the world of artificial intelligence. I feel like saying big data scares me is like so early 2000s, but it's uh, it's making a comeback. Anyways, on today's big episode... Big data was before its time. <laughs> What's on today's episode, Mark? <laughs> We'll cover a, a research article or a, a survey article on some of the concerns about data and data leakage in uh, large language models like ChatGPT. Uh, before that, though, we'll cover some potential upcoming government action impacting a popular hacking device in the great nation of Canada. Uh, but we'll start out with a fun little research like post on a popular hacking device. Exactly. Got axe. Canada has, I cannot see device. Canada lumberjacks banning axes. They, they like their hacking devices up in Canada. Just wait and see. Maybe uh, before not the that, dolphin though, ones. we'll cover a, a research post on a way to social engineer Ubuntu users into installing packages that they might not want to. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and hack our way in with our axe. That's what we're we need to start about. arguing about pronunciation. I, I, you're probably doing Ubuntu, Ubuntu. Uh, I, I never know how to pronounce Ubuntu. Ubuntu, Ubuntu on whatever. my Asus laptop. A Asus, Asus. I'm sorry, I don't pronounce many words right. But Canadians like me. So let's start today uh, with a fun post that I actually saw on. I think it was like r slash netsec on Reddit. Got to um, it. Exactly. Genuinely, now that Twitter has completely imploded, uh, r slash netsec and r slash cybersecurity, I think, are the last two uh, like social media things I follow now in order to get yeah. cyber news. Reddit has a little toxicity on some subs, but those subs <laughs> are good. I also recommend r slash hacking and r slash master hacker for fun. Master hacker is actually more a joke about people who claim they can hack. But yes, a lot of good security subreddits. My one complaint about r slash hacking is that like half the posts I tend to see are someone being like, how can I hack my friend's Facebook account? Oh, that yeah, sort of weird. kind of low quality, like whatever. <laughs> but anyways, uh, this was not one of those posts. Um, it was an article with some researchers at Aqua Nautilus who published a post describing some security issues and how Ubuntu, the Linux uh, distribution, handles users that try and execute non-existent commands. Um, so if you're not a Linux user, um, while they do have a graphical interface, a lot of Linux users tend to work primarily with the bash shell. Um, when you go to type in a command, it'll look through the path environment variable to look for different like binary executables that could run it. it could be like a Python uh, package that's been registered to handle that command. You can even set up aliases. For example, I can have an alias that says like, I don't know, um, block Corey. And that maps to a bash script that then like blocks Corey out of, of course you would. something for the day. Yeah, whatever. Um, but so in Linux, as you're entering a command, if you have a typo or if you just enter a command for a application you don't have installed, there's actually a built-in package in Ubuntu that handles that and suggests potential installable packages that could handle that command. Uh, so in Ubuntu, they call it the command not found package. And basically how it works, if you enter in a command, for example, like ifconfig, which used to be the uh, preferred way to get IP address and network interface information. Um, it's not actually installed by default anymore on Debian or Ubuntu uh, deployments. So if you type in ifconfig, it'll say that command was not found, but then it will recommend that you install the net tools package um, in order to um, get that command back. So it knows that ifconfig is one of the commands exposed by the net tools package. And this command not found package setup uh, makes that recommendation. Um, so the command not found package, it looks in two primary places for Ubuntu installations. It looks in the apt or apt repository. Uh, thanks, Mac or Teams or whatever, giving me those funky little emojis. Um, if you're not familiar with apt, it's Ubuntu and really Debian as a whole uses this as their main package management system. Um, but Ubuntu 
has a Ubuntu specific one called Snap, or more specifically, Snapcraft. And this Snapcraft, command off that, that sounds fun. It's by the uh, way, for the audio only listeners, when Mark is talking about the emojis, you have to actually see the video version of our podcast to know what he's talking about. Yeah, exactly. I I should turn it off. In fact, I did turn it off. I don't know how the heck it came back it's, it's on. It's built but... in your Mac operating system, so you it definitely is, have to turn it's it off in for Mac me OS. I count starting with my thumb when I'm counting from one, and now it just always makes a little thumbs up thing. That's uh, very UK of you. Okay, yeah, back whatever. to Snapcraft, the very back to cool Snapcraft. sounding uh, Ubuntu specific app store. Yeah. Um, so I guess back to the There's... command not found uh, package first. So uh, it looks at these two different sources. When it comes to the apt package repository, it actually maintains a list of known commands and their associated packages that run those commands. So for example, it's got basically a configuration file or a database, for lack of a better description, where it says, okay, if someone enters ifconfig, I know that that is a part of NetTools. Uh, this database, it comes with the application itself. It's updated anytime you update the package or command not found package. Uh, but Snap, on the other hand, uh, when it's trying to find an application in that repository, there's actually like another, I don't know, API or uh, endpoint it can communicate with using the snap advise dash snap command, where basically based off a command, it can recommend the package to potentially go and use. Um, this command not found package has logic for handling typos. It's like if I type if config with two Gs, it'll recognize it. First, it won't find anything for that. Um, specific command because it's a typo, but it'll try and recommend things that are similar uh, to try and handle those those cases of potential typos. So, anyways, uh, in their blog post, Aqua goes through. Corey's showing a screenshot, like the actual logic of how it decides which packages to show based off the command that you entered. And they had this hypothesis that you know maybe there's a way an attacker could abuse this in order to trick people into installing a malicious application. Um, so they first thought about you know, the apt package repository, but there's actually a pretty strong vetting process in order to have your package um, delivered through the apt packaging system. So while it's not impossible to sneak a malicious application in there, it would be a little bit more difficult. Um, but they then point to the Snap app store that Ubuntu maintains as another potential avenue for this. Um, so in the, the Snap uh, Packages app store, there's actually two different types of applications. There's one that's called Strict Confinement, which is basically an entirely sandboxed app that by default can't even access other files or even the network as a whole. Uh, and then there's what they call Classic Apps, which is basically just like an apt package, uh, full access to everything on the system you install it on. Uh, they do have a set of APIs, I guess. Uh, they call it the Snap Interface, where one of these strictly confined packages can at least interact with some components outside of the sandbox, like uh, playing a sound through audio control or even user management access or even network access. But it has to be like explicitly granted entitlements for that package. Uh, they discuss one of those uh, uh, types of entitlements that's pretty commonly given to a, a package on the Snap uh, marketplace, uh, which is giving it the ability to launch a, a GUI, a window. Uh, on Linux, there's really two main ways to handle windows, like graphical interfaces. There's X11, which is the relatively old one, uh, and then the somewhat uh, newer one called Wayland. Uh, X11, it's actually pretty old. It's one of the original ways to get a graphical interface on Linux. Um, and it's missing quite a bit of security protections you might expect. For example, there's no real prevention from one window directly interacting with another, another window you pop up. In their blog post, they even have a little demo video showing basically using a keylogger, exploiting one of these weaknesses in X11 uh, to uh, key log credentials that were entered into a web browser, which is kind of interesting. Um, so anyways, they go through all these kind of weaknesses around Snap packages, uh, but then they talk about specifically uh, how Snap maps a command name to an associated package. Um, so for example, 
Um, in Snap, there's the concept of the application name uh, and then the Snap package name. So like I might have a, a an application called Mark's Super Awesome Widget. Uh, and it might have a Snap called, uh, I don't know, Graphical Interface, whatever, uh, as the application you download. By default, Snap's command format is the snap name dot application name. So in order to launch this application, you need to enter graphical interface dot marks super awesome widget in order to launch it. Um, when a snap name is identical to the application name, though, they actually simplify it down. And so if my snap name was graphical interface and my application name was graphical interface, instead of having to type graphical interface dot graphical interface, you could literally just type the single word graphical interface. They also have the concept of letting developers register a deviation, so an alias. So for example, I could register um, Mark the Liberty as an alias for Mark's super awesome widget. And so if you type Mark the Liberty, it would then launch that. But that goes through this whole manual vetting process, which isn't really useful for attackers. Um, but uh, an attacker could just go register something like command name as the snap and command name as the application if it's up for grabs. And now they own, for lack of a better word, that command name pointing to their snap application. So I, this is a lot of me talking. Let's give an example, one that they actually gave in their blog post. Um, they point to this package called Tarquin and a command called Tarquin GUI. Um, so the Tarquin GUI command is mapped to a package in the Snap repository called Tarquin, where if you've got it installed, entering the Tarquin GUI command would then launch the Tarquin package. Um, this means that the maintainers of this package, they got a approved alias uh, from that Snap uh, app store for that Tarquin GUI as an alias mapping to their package. Uh, the researchers, though, found that Tarquin GUI itself has not been taken, it's not been claimed by anyone on the Snap package app store. So they went and created an application called Tarquin GUI and a Snap called Tarquin GUI. So they owned Tarquin GUI dot Tarquin GUI, which then gets condensed into just Tarquin GUI. And so now if you go and try and run that command on a system, on an Ubuntu system that doesn't have that installed, uh, you get two suggestions, one for the Tarquin application and one for theirs that they registered called Tarquin GUI. And you as the user have to try and guess which one is the actual legitimate one. And this means an adversary could then, for example, post one that has a slightly higher version number. You as the user might think, oh, that must be like the legitimate one or the updated one. You download that. In reality, it's not the Tarquin app you were looking for. It's one that the adversary had under their control. Um, Circling back to apt packages, they found that 26% of apt package commands were available to register under the Snap Store. They had an example for Jupyter Notebook, a very popular command for a very popular application um, that a lot of data scientists will use in order to, to handle big data. Um, they found that they could register a Jupyter Notebook as a Snap application. So if you went and tried to run that command on a system that didn't have the actual one installed, it would now suggest the real one from the apt package index and the snap one from the snap app repository. And you would have to figure out which one is the correct one. They also point to another weakness for typo squatting, where, as we mentioned earlier, um, the command not found package will try and suggest similar applications. But an attacker can just go straight up and register the typoed package name or the typoed command name, like I have config with two Gs. And now they own that one, and that is what will be suggested if someone fat fingers in the command as they entered in their host. So basically, this whole post was about all the different ways you can abuse this, specifically the Snap application library for Ubuntu, which has way less controls and way less vetting, um, so that any Ubuntu user that doesn't have a package installed might get recommended a potentially malicious one through this. It was a, I thought this was a really interesting article of like another way, like kind of similar to, you know, hosting malicious Python packages and the Python package index or node packages and the node package index, like different ways where you can potentially social engineer someone into installing something that they, they shouldn't have or that they weren't, weren't thinking of. 
Um, they had some recommendations. So, for example, try and verify the package sources. But, uh, like, I, I don't know how practical that one is. I have to admit, when I go to, like, when I get a fresh new Linux server and, you know, I haven't set it up with everything that I need, I'm going through trying to run commands and missing packages, I do tend to just copy paste with some of their suggestions in there just to save time. I feel like I would very easily fall victim to the, a style of attack that exploited this weakness, uh, at least on Ubuntu systems. I, I could too. I, I think the kind of people that would be susceptible to this are already smarter power users than average, because if your command lines, you know, apt getting or, or, or installing things in Linux, <laughs> you by definition are probably a little more technical than the average Joe. But by that, that same token, we're so used to doing it and, uh, you know, using tab autocomplete for some of the things where packages were looking at, at least I do. I'm pretty sure that in app get you can tab autocomplete common packages and it gives you suggestions. Uh, I could easily fall for, uh, oh, there's two and one looks like it's a higher version number. It, that's hard to check. I mean, in, in, in the past, you would say, hey, let's get a checksum, some sort of hash to verify this is the right download. But in this case, you're getting the right download and they could verify the checksum of your download. It just happens to be an adversarial person that has a legitimately published I mean, can you call it legitimate? They're they're following all the rules. <laughs> so it's a legitimately published package that's out to get you. They did. A, so Aqua's guidance was mostly geared towards the developers themselves because they are the ones best positioned to combat this. And basically it boiled down to if you own a apt package, go register the snap name for it so that you protect a bunch of users on it. Uh, and if you own, if you're a Snap developer and you've got an alias approved for your package, go register that alias as a corresponding package name, just so someone else can't abuse this system as well. And those are a couple of like extra hoops that if you aren't specifically aware of this potential weakness, this guys, I guess vulnerability for lack of a better name, like it is something that could be easy to abuse and easy to potentially trick victims uh, that are at least using Ubuntu. Now, this is isolated specifically to Ubuntu. Canonical, the maintainers of Ubuntu, are the only ones that have this kind of funky app store like this that's also included in their command suggestion package. So you, I guess you could put some of the blame on Canonical for having really this slightly less vetted app store uh, as a suggested source of truth. When so many folks are used to apt as a package repository, which has a strong vetting process, being at least a little bit uh, safer to use. I don't know. Either way, I thought it was an interesting post. And it's I'm cool. betting that it feels like this is now that now that this knowledge is out there, this will probably be a class of vulnerabilities we see exploited a little more frequently now. Uh, Especially like with a... supply chain issues. I mean, yep. to me, before we had these big, we, we call them digital supply chain issues when one big company gets hacked and their source code is poisoned directly from the source. But I kind of consider these these kind of app repository poisonings a, a weird kind of a supply chain issue. While you're not really, you know, hacking Ubuntu or Canonical, you're you're kind of poisoning the the well of their their app repository, and it's a, to me one of the ways you can accidentally install malicious software through what's typically a trusted supply chain of a, a download repository. So uh, it's not the first time we've seen like publicly available Linux packages being exploited in some way. I mean, usually it's sometimes them just. Uh, maybe actually hacking a company and putting up a trojanized version of a package. But in this case, the, the tricky way you can socially engineer people to download a package seems similar to me. So I think you're right. It, it seems like a class of attack that would be useful as a kind of supply chain-like attack. Yep. So if you are an application developer for Ubuntu specifically, make sure that if you're packaging or deploying your package on apt, you are also deploying it on a snap or at least registering it. Uh, so moving on to the next topic, uh, Corey, I don't know if you've got one of these, but there's a device that I've been really wanting to get my hands on. I know quite a few of our coworkers have them uh, called a Flipper Zero that really blew up yep. a couple of years ago, I feel like. 
Um, if you're not familiar with the Flipper Zero, it's basically a ESP32 chip, like the same chip that we've been using in our uh, DEF CON badges for the past couple of years, but in a custom enclosure with a whole bunch of super useful interfaces on it. Um, so within its tiny little format uh, package, it's got GPIO pins for connecting like serial uh, access to different for hardware hacking. It's got an infrared transceiver for basically acting as an infrared remote control. It's got a, a, a one wire pogo pin, which is a commonly used for like apartment key fobs and keys to get into like through gates and stuff. It's got a sub one gigahertz transceiver for communicating with smart devices, IOT, garage doors, gates, barriers, whatever. It's got 125 kilohertz RFID radio that can clone and emulate RFID cards. It's got an NFC reader for uh, interacting with or writing or reading NFC key cards. And it's got Bluetooth low energy or BLE support for interacting with Bluetooth devices. It's basically like this little two and a half inch by one inch device with a LCD screen and some buttons that lets you do a whole bunch of radio frequency, infrared, Bluetooth, uh, and even some physical hardware hacking all in a small little format. It's a pretty dang cool tool. Uh, yeah, I'm it's, by the way, it's, it's not a smart radio per se, uh, but it's it's like almost every type of, of wireless type, a lot of hacking interfaces minus having the full radio spectrum. So very yep. cool. I, I do want to add the one thing it isn't is anything new. Uh, everything no. it does, you know, all the different hacking, like this being considered a, a device that... You know, we'll get into what our story is, but you can still do all this stuff e without this device. You know, if you have a, I, I believe it's a Linux system underneath and all the tools they use for the different type of radio hacking it does, it, it's kind of like a, a, a Wi-Fi pineapple. Everything a Wi-Fi pineapple uses for hacking is software that's been released open source a long time ago. Uh, and if you had the right transceivers for a normal Linux computer, you could you could do all this same stuff. You just need you know something that can read and, and write to NFC cards, something that can uh, read to RFID. So so you don't need this device to do the, all the hacks, but the key thing is it makes it very simple and convenient. So you don't have to be that nerd that figures out all this open source yourself. You don't have to go buy a whole bunch of input output radio interfaces for your your laptop to plug into USB. This thing just has it built, like you said, in this really convenient small form factor. But I yeah. I point that out because I think we'll get into the story. But this this isn't new. This is just kind of an easy button for things that existed. It is. And unfortunately, that has brought it under the target of regulators in Canada right now. Um, so the Canadian government announced that they are in the process of trying to ban this device for sale in Canada. Um, they cite really the rampant car thefts that have been hitting not just Canada, but the United States as well. You may have heard of the Kia boys on social media showing how you can um, basically steal a Kia or some Hyundai cars, even with just an empty ballpoint pen to turn the uh, to turn the ignition um, without a key at all. Um, so basically the government's host the Canadian government is hosting a national summit on combating auto theft. And in the statement for the summit, they said, quote, we're pursuing all avenues to ban devices used to steal vehicles by copying the wireless signals for remote keyless entry, such as the Flipper Zero which would allow for the removal of those devices from the Canadian marketplace through collaboration with law enforcement agencies. So they specifically call out the Flipper Zero as something on their radar for being banned in Canada in the very near future. And I wanted to talk about this because like, this isn't the first time we've seen governments try and regulate or act on a security tool uh, that, in my opinion, isn't going after the actual issue. It's going after the the easy, most visible win option for this government that doesn't really understand what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, um, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, you can ban this tool and it might make it harder, but are they going to ban every RFID card reader and writer? RFID cards are perfectly legitimate. You can get a USB device that that helps you do that. And you can plug it into a normal computer. Are they going to ban laptops running Linux? Uh, they, they, you know, it's. Are they going to ban like crowbars? 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ban crowbars is the non-technical way, but still, I mean, I can see the fact that this NFC and RFID hacking makes it much easier to just unlock a car without a crowbar. But banning this one device is not going to ban car theft. I mean, you can make one of these devices yourself pretty cheaply uh, with things that they're not going to be able to ban. Can they? Are they going to ban Raspberry Pis? Are they going to ban this chipset? Are they? It, it's it's security theater, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, it and might the make funny it thing is, oh, go ahead. It's the funny thing is, like, despite what social media will show you, like, it it can work to unlock a car door if you can intercept like the unlock button key fob while that key fob is out of range of the car. You can then replay that with this tool when you're close to the car. On but old cars, <laughs> on, well, even on new ones, if you again, if it's out of range. Uh, because if it is in range, all modern cars in the last like 30 years use rolling codes. But that's so what as I soon say, as yeah. You, yeah, yeah, there's as ways as around this type this, of replay attack. Exactly. As soon as they're in range, like your captured signal, you can't relay it anymore. Like it, yeah. it will not work. And so you'll see in social media, people will be like, oh, look, I can use this to, you know, replay my key fob unlock thing and unlock the car. But it's in a very controlled environment. The reality is like in order to use this in real life to break into like my car as an example, you would have to follow me like out of the HEB grocery store as I'm sitting there hitting the unlock button on my keys while I'm out of range and then quickly run over before I get in range and replay that signal to unlock the car. Like it's a very small window where it's actually practical. Um, it's not like you can just walk up to any car, pull your flipper zero out of your pocket and like hit a magic button and now that car is unlocked. That's not how it works. But it's unfortunately because of like how it's been portrayed in social media, uh, how the governments have picked up on it. Like they're hyper-focused on this being the root cause of like how people are breaking into Kias and other cars. When in reality, the issue is way simpler. It's that a lot of these cars, specifically by Kia and Hyundai to throw them under the bus, are missing some core security features like ignition interlocks and lockouts to just make them really easy to steal with any basic tools. You don't need a flipper zero. You just need a, a ballpoint pen in some cases to go steal some of these cars. And unfortunately, they're I feel like they're focusing on like the, the scary boogeyman, that the easy button, kind of similar to how we've seen even attempts in the US in the past to like <clears throat> regulate Metasploit or Kali Linux and potentially impact ethical hackers along the way instead of going after the actual issue that is causing the problem. So I don't know. I, I think I agree with you. I, I This feels like security theater. I don't like that this is the path they're going down instead of going back to the car manufacturers and going, yeah, why the heck aren't mitigate you Mitigate using... replay attacks more. Yeah, yeah. Ro rolling codes help. But if, if there is even a, a, a kind of one-off use case where you can still trick past rolling codes... You need more mitigations, car manufacturer. This is unsafe. This is bad security design. It's not the, the fault of the devices that make something possible easier. It's the fact that it's possible in the first place uh, that really it's should funny. be the focus of the government. This issue is only an issue in North America, uh, specifically with cars in North America, the US and Canada. It's not a big issue in Europe. And it's because these manufacturers... They wanted to sell cheaper cars in the States. That's, I guess that's what consumers were demanding. And so they specifically excluded some security features like ignition lockouts that exist in the European models of these cars that don't exist in the North American versions. And that's why they're so easy to steal. Uh, so it is. Although I would question, that, here's where I would question vendors. Why are security like there's probably cases where maybe you might need a modern chipset for additional security capabilities and stuff like that. But I think the the ECUs is the computing units you put in cars to the, the upgraded version that offers a little more security can't be thousands of dollars more. So why would the car that has that feature be thousands of dollars more? Maybe car manufacturers should not <laughs> charge stupid prices just to have good security. Now, if it's, they really yeah. need some sort of hardware to improve the security that justifies the cost, maybe. But either way, if you are Canadian uh, and you get are interested now before you get <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I, that is the ex exact advice I was going to give. Go buy it now before it becomes Sorry, yeah. illegal in the country. <laughs>
you used to be able to buy these on Amazon here in the States until Amazon cracked down on it because they were concerned you know, about uh, it. They're cool. going to crack it down and uh, someone will make something called the Whale 2. That's essentially the <laughs> same device, but it's not specifically on the banned list. So just buy the Whale 2 when that comes out. Or well, if you're just someone that wants to make project. money. And, <laughs> yeah, it's a, like can all these, these are... yourself. Exactly. Like maybe just release the schematic on how to build it with the off the shelf components that are very easy to source and totally legal still. It's yeah. they're not they're not going to solve the issue. They're just going to make it more difficult for nerds and security researchers to use the tools that they want to use. Yeah. And Canada can't ban the actual sensors and tools you used to make one of those because then NFC, RFID, all, all the things you need to legitimately use will not be possible for the companies that need to actually write those cards at work so that you can get into a doorway. I think the good news is like this is creating a big splash, at least in the cybersecurity community. community. Maybe sane heads will prevail and like they'll listen to reason, but I don't know. I my cynicism says they're going to try and take what they perceive as a, a win and ban the boogeyman device without actually solving the real problem. Yeah. Oh. Especially during election years. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Gross. <laughs> I don't know if it's an election year in Canada, but that, that seems to make them want to publicly have headlines about how they fix some boogeyman. Exactly. Oh, well, anyways, moving on. Last story. Uh, so, this last week, uh, Menlo Security published a, a survey report that, you know, normally I don't pay a whole lot of attention to these kind of marketing based reports, but this one stood out to me because it's a topic that you and I, we even made a prediction on uh, this year as well, too. Um, so the report was titled, How Employee Usage of Generative AI is Impacting Organizational Security. So it starts by describing how tools like ChatGPT and BARD and all the other ones have really helped. Uh, increased productivity across teams that use them, uh, but that that increased productivity might result in inadvertently sharing sensitive data and information or PII. Uh, it starts with a real world example where a group of Samsung engineers from the company's semiconductor team uh, copy pasted source code that they were working on into chat GPT for tips on how to make it more efficient. And at the end, that meant that because ChatGPT retains everything you put into it for training data, that source code could now potentially be used to formulate responses to requests from other users, effectively compromising that um, company data. So through this report- just news too, by the way, to give another example of ChatGPT leaking passwords that had likely mm -hmm. been shared as prompts. Exactly. Um, so this report, they analyzed generative AI interactions from 500 global companies, as they call them, just unnamed organizations. And they went, a few, went through a few interesting key findings. Uh, so first off, they found that generative AI usage increased 1,200% from November 20, 2022 to May 2023. So over the course of what, like five, six months, a 1,200% increase in usage, which makes sense. Like we saw... Generative AI, ChatGPT specifically, but some of the other competitors really explode uh, early last year and continue to grow in adoption throughout the course of last year, leading into this year as well, too. Um, some key stats they found uh, average users uh, visited ChatGPT 32 times over the course of a month. So 32 visits per user per month, basically daily using ChatGPT as a part of their job. Um, they found that uh, over the course of 30 days, uh, 10,000 files from these 500 companies were uploaded. The bulk of them were just text files, but many of them were documents and some of them were scripts or actual executables. Uh, they found just over 3,000 copy-paste events over the course of the, of the month of their uh, survey. Um, they found several DLP events, data loss prevention events, uh, relating to input on generative AI. Uh, with, in fact, 5% of them being payment card information, 50% of them just being PII, 24% of them being uh, confidential documentation, 2% of them being medical information, and then 1.5% of them just being other restricted information. So people are pasting sensitive and PII data straight up into ChatGPT, where it will become a part of the training set over time. That's the whole point of ChatGPT, is to be a source of training information 
for the underlying open AI model that they have. Um, man, so I guess none of this is really groundbreaking information, but it is just another data point showing that, yes, these tools are useful, but you really need to consider exactly what you're putting into these public models because that public model will eat it up as training data and potentially spit it back out to anyone else using that model. Um, at the end of the report, they pointed to a few like takeaways, like what the response should be. They specifically call out that traditional data loss prevention tools and CASB tools aren't really well positioned for generative AI. Um, really, you need tools that can control what users are entering into web forms. They recommend if you've got something that can, uh, limit the number of characters that users can paste into input fields. Uh, basically, they say users aren't going to manually enter in all of their source code. So if you can prevent them from copy pasting it in or implement rules that can look for uh, software code being uh, pasted in, that's a good place. Um, I feel like this really needs to boil down to user education first and foremost. Yeah, I was going to say before, it's nice to have technical controls that will help, but it really should be a policy. Start with a policy and make your users aware of it. I mean, I think most of us want to encourage our users to use tools that help efficacy or efficiency, but you have to have clear policy around how you can use these LLMs and, and other generative AI tools. And you definitely want uh, you know, to do clear rules of what types of things you can't upload. I think another thing, Mark, too, is a lot of the ones that have EULAs where they basically say your prompts are our information now, are the free ones. So find uh, the tools that you want your company's employees to use and get versions where part of their EULA is you have your own private data store where your data, whether you put it in prompt, may maybe you do need to share source code because you want to take advantage of, of uh, AI-based code, code checking. Uh, but make sure in that case, you're using some sort of uh, AI that is, or machine learning service that will not share your data with others. And most of the big ones like Copilot from Microsoft slash GitHub or Code Whisper from AWS, they do include provisions in their ULA like that, where when you sign up for these services, they are not going to share your source code. The real risk is from just you know random engineer who sees or keeps reading about all these benefits of AI helping out with their code, and they just do straight up copy paste their stuff into chat GBT, the public one. And now they just share their company data outside. Um, I do like, Corey, what are your thoughts on, it feels like things are evolving quickly in the world of large language models and chat GBT. And like our use of them is evolving quicker than our ways to control our use of them. Like you mentioned a policy that is ob obviously step one, but when it does come to controls, like should companies just block access until we've got the right controls in place to properly secure how these tools are used? I'm curious what your thoughts I, are on I, that. I think that's a possible solution depending on the type of organization. Like if you are a someone that deals in sensitive government data, probably. If you're a normal private business, I, I, I think that comes to normal security risk management. Like you're going to have companies that are hungry especially smaller ones for some sort of edge. And I, I think the, the promise of AI is you can give more efficiency to a smaller amount of people. So I think it really comes down to a business decision of what you have up to lose and, and how you're using the LLM models, which will define what type of information you're sharing. But I do think there might be an argument in some companies that have certain type of information where you might be right that you, maybe you should just block certain LLMs or certain uh, machine learning services where you don't want users putting data and you know it might go public if they use it. So I think yes, but it depends. Yeah, I hear you. Either way, like it, it, this does feel like an industry where we are moving very quickly. I think the good news is like it it feels like others in the space are moving quickly too. Like this is getting a a lot of attention from federal governments and just legislatures in general to try and put some guardrails around things. Um but I don't know. I there are still legitimate uses to things yes. like chat GBT and Bard like 
way, very good benefits that I don't think we should totally prevent users from using them. We just need to make sure we're using it safely and not yeah. pasting company and personal data into chat GPT. <laughs> yeah, I think we need rules around it. And I also don't think we can skip the education of even though they have good uses, they also have hallucinations and bad things, especially yeah. things like Bard and Chat GPT, where they're using uncurated public data for training. Uh, if they're full of lies because the internet is full of lies, even if you're just getting it to help write about something like phishing or about a certain law or, or, or maybe to help you with figuring out how to file legal pr briefs based on certain precedents. I, I'm using these examples on, on purpose because there have been very big case of incidents where uh, what it spit out that, yes, could have helped a lawyer write a brief much quicker <laughs> turned out to be half false. So yep. beyond just the security risk to your company, uh, just realize that this is statistics at scale. This is not a smart system that actually is artificial intelligence and knows stuff. It's just using statistics at scale to figure out good answers, but its answers are only as good as the training data. Bad data in makes bad data out. And just remember a lot of them are, are based on the public internet and I think uh, most of our listeners know that everything on the internet is true, right? There's nothing false on the internet. It's never happened. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and this is also like that point is why I'm not super worried about chat GBT stealing everyone's jobs. Because I feel like our end state for this is it's like a calculator where it makes us all more efficient but you still need someone to like interpret the results. Yes, In the case of hallucinations, hallucinations, you definitely need someone to make sure that the results are accurate. And it'll just make us all better at our jobs, not straight up replace us. That said, maybe we do get to a future where we have general AI that is smarter than any human in existence and we all work ourselves you're, out you're, of a job. You're more pro on me than not the job, the job thing, because I think the issue now is the company's moving fast and thus not taking time to find curated data. If, 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 if AI if machine learning needs big data and to be good, it needs curated data. Uh, they grabbed all the big data they could quickly, but over time, mm -hmm. Uh, smart companies are going to write things to help curate the data. And whatever company that already has a crap load of data starts to curate it and make it more correct. <laughs> I do think chat GPT can get rid of some positions or not chat GPT, machine learning algorithms that do different things. It so is interesting. We'll see. Like, we'll see. The discussion is starting to pivot back towards the data. Like the New York Times just sued OpenAI uh, about a month, yep. month and a half ago. Um, for using their article data and what they claim was a, a copyright infringement. Um, I, I wonder if like the next iteration, now that we've, the cat's out of the bag, there is large language models, uh, machine learning, but maybe the next iteration is like how they actually source their data and license it from trusted sources. Yeah, and if we're talking about power and asymmetric power, Mark, since uh, we usually, we, we don't tend to end on good notes, so let me put on my dystopian hat. The issue has never been AI and ML. The issue has been big data holders. If you think tech companies like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, uh, your ISP, the people that are gathering, the, the organizations that are gathering every bit of data, Facebook, by the way, TikTok um, in many countries, if you think that's not a big deal and you think why you don't need your privacy because if you're not doing anything wrong, there's no problem. AI's value is entirely driven on data. The freaking algorithm is just statistics. I actually think all this crap about good AI models is, yeah, they're, they're getting better, but that's not the magic. The magic is the big data it's based on. The real power is the data. Think of the stockbroking companies that are right on the backbone of NASDAQ's uh, uh, right in New York where the internet router is, and they learn about trades faster than anyone. Think about the history. What organization has recorded every single NASDAQ trade, every single stock market trade? Because it's not about the data happening now. It's about having that huge amount of historical data. Think about organizations like domain name tools that don't just know domain now, but they know the history of every domain. That type of big data ownership 
that is where power is going to come from in AI. The models, the actual technology, there will be a dime a dozen. You'll be able to download open source to do whatever you want on your home GPU. But will you have the data to get good answers? Probably not. The people that own the data are going to own the power. That tech 1%, uh, they are going to be asymmetrically powerful in ways that scare me. So what you're saying is it's time to get into like the solid state drive business uh, because they'll need all the to store all this data and that's where all the money's going to be. And if you're someone that's not already getting all that data from your company, but you're someone that presides storage to the companies that do get all the data, maybe you have it in. But but yes, yeah. the ownership of all this data that human beings have unfortunately been given away for free for ages and not paying attention to their own history, letting someone else keep their history in the cloud, you've given up all your power. And that's where AI, the best AI are the people that have that data. That's why even ChatGPT, the people at OpenAI that can get the immediate most update results will always beat what they give to consumers, which will have yesterday's data. And yesterday's data is not good enough anymore, especially for things like stock market predictions and so, sorry, I, I had to go a little bit dystopian in the world is burning, Well, it's a good Mark. thing that uh, I just keep all my cash under the mattress and I don't deal with that dang stock market anyway. So, I, it sounds like I'm safe. <laughs> yes. I guess that's why some people buy gold. Yeah. Uh, you can buy gold at Costco. Did you know that? I did not. <laughs> and apparently, not with, surprised. Uh, it's actually a pretty good source for it. Beats out a lot of transaction fees you'd otherwise pay through some other gold sourcing agencies. I don't know. I saw an article about it recently and it kind of piqued my interest. <laughs> Sorry, we, we went down a rapid hole for AI, but it's an interesting subject and it's one that's going to affect not just security, but all of technology, society, and politics for decades and centuries to come. And if you don't want to deal with it, just unplug your computer and go buy your gold at Costco. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks again for listening. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. If you have any questions on today's topics or suggestions for future episode topics, you can reach out to us on Insta at watchguard underscore technologies. That will never not be weird. We should do uh, blue sky or man, blue sky might take off. Who knows? We we'll should, see. but that just involves signing up for another social media account yeah. and I'm trying to get rid of all mine. This episode just talked about big data, and now we want to give it to more social networking organizations. Oy vey. Anyways, thanks again for listening, and you will hear from us next week.